sorry uh, can, can we record the video so we can upload it on yeah YouTube? sure of course okay, okay thanks. yes thanks yeah. yeah okay great um as i go along i'll try and point out um where the code and data is available we tried to make things open um so hopefully this is more than just um uh i'll try to give a broad overview and then if you're interested you can find the code and um, dig in and contact us if you have additional information information or questions. Okay, so um, broadly, we've been working in a lot of different areas of electrochemistry and materials discovery. Um, I would say, as a lot of people in electrochemistry or um, computational catalysis are right now, um, the example I'll use for most of this talk is CO2 to fuels, just because um, that was something that I had uh, original experience with as a postdoc working with Karen and Jens um, at Stanford. And so I'll show how we've been trying to extend some of those ideas. And then we also have some work in selective thermal hydrogenation with collaborators at Penn State, um, some new work when water desalination and remediation with LBL. Um, more from my PhD work, uh, we've been looking at ionomer design at catalyst interfaces where the interface is a little bit more complicated. And we also have some collaborative work in trying to design alloys and materials for oxidation resistance in additive manufacturing. Um, although these applications are sort of all over the place, we sort of use the same uh, way of thinking for everything. And so um, as engineers, we often are interested in designing new materials that have some goals. Um, if you've been to these other lectures, I'm sure these are very similar ideas to what you've seen in elsewhere. Uh, for some hypothesized material, bulk structure, surface, whatever, um, we're interested in predicting properties that we think are correlated with experiments, like standard thermochemical descriptors, or bulk stability or surface stability, cost, um, kinetics of transition states on these surfaces. And uh, this lends itself to really interesting design of experiments or discovery questions, like of all the surfaces I can imagine in some sort of class, I wanna find all the ones that have um, some set of properties. So maybe I want the bulk material to be stable under reaction conditions. I want the surface to be stable enough to show up in a nanoparticle. I want the surface to be both active and selective for my reaction. Um, maybe I also wanna know what conditions to run under. And it's been relatively straightforward to ask questions on any one of these, but it's been really difficult to do this for an entire class of materials like alloys or sulfides or intermetallics or whatever. And it's also been difficult to do multiple properties at the same time. So I'll talk about the steps we're taking in that direction. In order to answer these questions, you really have to be thinking about um, how to bring surrogate modeling into these um, questions because these spaces are just so large and there's so many different properties that we really don't have time to do it all with DFT. So, um, my background as a PhD student was from a systems engineering group. So we think about things as inputs and outputs and what we're trying to um, connect together and model and sensitivity and everything. Um, so example of design spaces that we've been thinking about are of all the metals or intermetallics or 2D materials or oxides that are already known. Um, these are things that we can enumerate and consider. Um, we can choose any one of those in a structure selection box. Um, we want to calculate properties that we think are gonna be correlated with experiments, thanks to work, for example, that Jens and Karen have done on microkinetics or others. Um, and the first place that machine learning comes into this is, um, DFT is quite slow, but accurate for modeling covalent bonds. And microdynamics is quite fast, but really doesn't include bond breaking and bond um, formation. And so machine learning potentials can help bridge this um, gap. And so that's the first place that surrogate modeling comes in. So, um, the, this idea has been around for a long time. Um, the first Baylor Pernello paper was over 10 years ago. Um, there's really this um, thriving community of people who are trying to build machine learning potentials for different properties. But as anyone who's tried to use these potentials knows, um, the concept is, is quite simple. It's easy to pull a model and train now. Um, if you have enough data, this is a relatively well-informed process. But what often happens is we have some sort of a reference potential that looks like this. Um, this is a little CO bouncing around on a copper surface. You can see the copper is jiggling around and the CO sort of dissociating. This is an EMT toy potential, so it's not perfect. Um, but in the limit of really small data, which is where we're often starting in catalysis, if you only show it the first 100 images from this and then ask it to do what's next, 
uh, you often get really unphysical behavior that makes it really, really difficult to try and improve the potentials. So for example, um, this is a really standard BP potential. We just took the first 100 snapshots on the left, used it to train on the right, and then asked it to predict forward. And right away, we see things that we know are not correct, like the copper surface just um, bouncing into each other, atoms overlapping, the CO flying off. Um, I can look at that and say it's ridiculous, um, but it's really difficult to tell a machine learning potential that that's not correct. And what has been really, really tr troubling is um, any configuration from this one on the right that you choose, you can't even run DFT on because the, um, the systems are so unphysical that you're going to have convergence problems. And so that makes any sort of active learning process really, really, really difficult um, to try and get to converge. So we've been taking some really simple steps in this direction. Um, this is work from one of my PhD students, Mohammed, um, and his collaborative work with um, Andy Peterson and others at Brown. Um, so the idea has basically been um, this unphysical bit of atoms flying into each other is really due to repulsive problems. Um, the machine learning potential is trained on these red points in, around 1.5 angstroms. It fits that quite well, but this purple um, line starts to deviate to the left because we never showed it that um, the energy should go up as you overlap two atoms. It just doesn't know that. It's not fair to expect it to understand that. But even incorporating something really simple like a Morse potential or Leonard Jones potential on top of it gets a much more physical interaction. Um, it's still not perfect when you extrapolate out to the right, but it at least avoids these sort of um, overlap or interaction effects. And so um, in the upper right, this is the same potential I showed you before. The one on the left is a machine learning one that was obviously incorrect. The one on the right is the one where we just added on a really, really simple Leonard Jones potential. And already we can see that surface looks a lot more stable. It's not perfect, but any one of these configurations, I could actually get to converge in vast for um, quantum espresso. And so um, this makes the job of choosing new training points much, much, much easier and makes this more robust. So this is work that we're doing in collaboration with Andy, as I said. Um, all of it is open source on um, GitHub. You can see the work that we've been doing. We call it AMP Torch. It's basically taking Andy's AMP code and playing around with how we could have done some things differently if we wrote it in PyTorch. Um, we have a lot of active learning stuff already in there, um, although the paper's not out yet. Um, if you have questions, for example, we've been working with people like August um, at DTU. Um, if you have questions, just let us know. Um, we're happy to develop this all, all together. Okay, so that's the first place that machine learning comes into this. Um, the next place is how do we choose the calculations we wanna do? And so as engineers, we wanna try and um, look at these properties and then ask a question, what is the next set of calculations we should do? So you can call it design of experiments or active learning or whatever, depending on what field you're from. Uh, we also wanna get some insights into what other materials we should be considering. And the second place the machine learning comes in is after you've done this enough times, going from the design space to the property space, eventually you can start to build another surrogate model that directly predicts the property from the initial thing based on calculations you've done in the past. And so again, this is a reasonable idea to talk about, but it's been a little bit difficult to make really general for catalysis. So the example um, I'll use is CO2 electroreduction, which I'm sure you're all very familiar with. Um, we're trying to find materials that um, selectively reduce CO2 to something of interest, not hydrogen, um, methane, methanol, ethanol, um, ethylene, whatever. Um, and so the first PhD student I had, Kevin, um, I asked him to basically start thinking about how we could be designing in this space. So um, Karen and others have already really well reviewed this area. Um, in CO2 electro reduction, we know that copper is the only one that's sort of interesting for these um, methane and C2 products. Um, microkinetic models have given us some understanding of why that is. They're not perfect, but um, I, I would say a necessary but not sufficient condition appears to be um, a moderate CO binding energy. If you want to do something more selective afterwards, that's a very hard problem. And I hope that um, others will be able to give us the right microkinetic model to understand. But again, um, the CO to CHO seems to be important in the pathway. And so um, uh, if you just look at these microkinetic models that do exist, um, copper seems to be about in the middle. Um, everything to the right 
He absorbs the CO, and so it doesn't stick around long enough to do anything interesting. Everything to the left seems to bind to CO2 strongly. And so an obvious question is, um, what sort of interesting materials or alloys or whatever can we find in the middle that might have properties like CO? Right? A lot of people have done this for individual um, intermetallics or alloys, but it's been really, really difficult for us to say systematically of all of the surfaces on all of the materials, what are the ones that might be interesting? Okay, so um, I asked Kevin to um, go to the materials project and try and find all of the stable um, intermetallics from anything in these gray boxes. So these are most of the common materials, um, transition metals, nitrides. Um, most of the data that we have in this area is published for the gray ones. We also have a lot of data for carbides and sulfides and other materials. Now we're trying to expand this even farther. Um, if you're interested in these other ones, let me know and I'm happy to share. Um, and so the question was, of the things that the material scientists already know are stable, what are the surfaces that we should be thinking about? And um, in catalysis, this becomes really difficult because the number of bulk compositions that come from this gray area is sort of order 10,000. That's sort of the size of the database. Um, we can run DFT calculations on 10,000 bulk structures. That's not a problem. And the, the material scientists have already done that. If you look at the low index facets, um, you go up to hundreds of thousands. And so now this is starting to become um, feasible, but troubling. If you think about all the different ways that you can put an adsorbate on one of those surfaces, um, all the different adsorption sites, people like Joey Montoya and Jeff Greeley and Thomas Bligard have done a lot of awesome work on making this really, really easy now. Um, this number explodes and we end up with order millions of sites on hundreds of thousands of surfaces. And we haven't even talked about the fact that um, the real surface may not be this perfectly ordered one. You might have some segregation or um, something else that happens that introduces additional configurations that you should be considering. And so we started out with the problem that the material scientists could brute force 10,000 bulk compositions with DFT. And we arrive at a point of 15 million adsorption sites times however many different adsorbates we're interested in. And that is a number that uh, we just cannot brute force. Like there is no supercomputer allocation that I can ask for that is gonna allow me to calculate 100 million different um, adsorption energies. So right from the beginning, we have to be thinking about how do we get predictive or how do we use the data that we have as efficiently as possible. The first thing is how do we catalog and um, uh, expand the data and do the calculations. And so an adsorption energy is, is really well established. Um, you take a bulk structure, you find the lattice constant. Um, things like John Kitchen's DFT book have a lot of really nice examples for how to do this. So that's one DFT calculation. You cut the surface, you do another surface relaxation, you say, where can you put something on the surface? Um, you end up with a few different sites. You put your little adsorbate like a hydrogen down, you do a final DFT calculation. The hydrogen binding energy in this case is this final one in the bottom right, minus the surface slab, um, minus wherever the hydrogen is coming from. Super well established on the science side. In order to make this easier for um, the workflow, um, this is a chain of events. Um, that I want to be able to um, run very quickly. Um, we've been developing this, uh, this workflow system that we call GASPI, which is written um, on top of this dynamic workflow management system called Luigi that Spotify uses for their own workflows. And so this is a little bit different from fixed pipelines that other people have used, where you define the pipeline all the way through and then you just run all the calculations. Instead, the way that we define things in this system is for every one of these blocks, we write a Python function that says, how do you figure out what prerequisite calculations are necessary? Um, how do you do the calculations if they're needed? And what additional things do you have to do or where are you gonna put the data afterwards? So this is just a different way of thinking about the same problem. If I wanna add another block onto the end, I don't have to write a new workflow from scratch. I just have to write an, um, these three components for this new block that allows me to insert it into the workflow. And then I just ask for that new thing and it figures out what has to happen. Uh, we've been using this internally. It's been working fairly well for the past couple of years. Um, I think there's been a little bit of use outside of our group. So I think Brian Goldsmith uh, um, has been playing around with this as well, as well as AJ on the side. Um, if you're interested, all of the work we do is on GitHub. 
um, feel free to take a look at it. If it's helpful for you, great. Um, if not, um, hopefully at least some of the ideas are helpful for your own workflows. Okay, so this process has been online for the past couple of years. Um, in the process, we've generated a relatively large data set of CO, hydrogen, oxygen, OH um, descriptors across lots of different intermetallics and low index facets. Um, at the time, there weren't many good, large, self-consistent databases like this. Um, Thomas Bligard had a really beautiful study um, last year systematically going across different alloys. Um, so that's another data set that I would say is sort of in the same realm and has been very helpful for us. Uh, we've also been interested in surface stability. So we did a bunch of um, cleavage energies across different intermetallics, and I'll talk about what those properties are. Um, but again, uh, the main point is that everything is fully automated. So if we write an active learning loop on top and we ask for a new energy, the calculation gets run behind the scene. And that's sort of what is most important in enabling. We've also tried to collect all of the software and data that we've done along the way um, on our website. So if you're interested in just downloading the ASC initial and final states and energies, um, that's available. And if you have problems accessing that, let us know. Okay. So all of this lives in a loop. And like I said, this has been running for the past couple of years. So um, every night we have a bunch of computers at NERSC at LBL um, that kick on. And um, they look at all of the calculations that have been done in the databases. And then they build models for every intermediate that we're interested in, like CO, hydrogen, OH, whatever. This gets repeated every night as we have more data. Over the course of the next day, um, we continually try and solve a design of computational or experiments problem. So every two hours, we check the queues. If there's um, spare throughput, we try and figure out what other points might be interesting for the chemistry. Those get submitted in an automated fashion to NERSC and to our servers at CMU and elsewhere. So um, in order to describe this process, the next step is we need to be able to build models for things like CO and hydrogen, which has also been really difficult across these really diverse um, compositions and surfaces. So the approach that we've taken, I think, is basically an extension of where um, catalyst structure property relationships has been, um, has sort of naturally been progressing. So we're interested in looking at a surface with a CO and predicting an energy. Great, that's the goal. Um, one thing that we could do is we could find a property like local electronic structure or D band center or something that is gonna be correlated with the adsorption energy and do a cheaper calculation or something that we can predict um, in order to correlate. Um, that has worked super, super, super well, but you either have to have a, uh, another model that can predict that D-band center from the structure, or you still have to do a DFT calculation for the surface. So it's still a little bit expensive um, to expand, and it's a little bit hard to systematically improve. Um, Philippe Sauté and a lot of others have talked a lot about how to use generalized coordination numbers or other coordination fingerprints. Um, we've done similar things for bimetallics. Um, that's also a very interesting approach. It works really, really well for pure metals, um, but it's a little bit difficult to really generalize to more complicated adsorption sites or bimetallics. And so um, you really have to have a physical understanding of how to include these things in the fingerprint in order to get these methods to work. I would say Yanni Pomkakis has, at uh, Pitt, has also done a lot of really cool work in extending these to bimetallics recently. Um, an alternative to both of these is basically uh, show the machine learning method the entire structure and let it decide what sort of coordination numbers it wants to come up with. And so um, this process is um, something that is, uh, I think, very exciting. It allows things to generalize, but this process of letting it decide has been a little bit, um, a little bit complicated. Okay, so the way that uh, the approach that we've been taking um, and which I think has been um, has paralleled similar approaches for small molecules and inorganic bulk crystal structures, um, has been basically take the surface, turn it into a graph where you look at um, uh, every node is an atom, every bond is an edge, and then based on that graph, try and predict properties. Um, this is work that uh, Soyin, who's now at um, Sogang University in Korea, um, really helped to, to push forward along with Kevin and June and Kaylee um, as well as Brandon Wood, who's a postdoc through the um, early science program on the upcoming machine at NERSC. Um, and 
the question then is, how do you connect this graph to a, um, a property? And so there was this really cool paper by Jeff Grossman where they basically showed how to do this for a bulk structure um, in 2018. And we saw that paper and we were like, well, what do we have to do in order to make that thing applicable for adsorption energies and surface properties as well? So this idea hinges on a, um, a graph convolution where you, um, you define an operation where every atom on the graph is allowed to look at every other atom on the graph um, that it's connected to. And you're allowed to mix those properties in. Um, so that's the, that's the convolution step. The same, um, the same step gets applied to every atom, but obviously its own properties and its neighbor's properties are gonna be different. And so you repeat this process multiple times every time you update your own internal properties. And then you look at all your neighbors and you do the process over and over again. After you repeat this convolution property, this convolution a bunch of times, you end up with new properties, gray, yellow, gr um, green, that are hopefully more helpful than the original ones that you started with. For every one of these nodes, we then feed it through a dense neural network in order to predict a local contribution to the final adsorption energy. And then at the very end, we apply a pooling operation, either a summation or a mean, in order to condense all those down to one final adsorption energy. Um, this process is uh, very general. There's lots of different convolution operations you can do. There's lots of ways of doing this pooling operation. Um, this is, uh, there's a lot of obvious extensions here. Okay, so um, all of these are open computer science questions. Um, graph convolutions are very hot in the machine learning community right now. There's been a lot of um, work very recently. Um, how you make these convolution operations how you um, incorporate uncertainty, how you extend a generative models, how you optimize, these are all really hard computer science questions. The, um, a lot of these convolutions are implemented in this PyTorch geometric library, which um, I think is also very interesting. If you go to the GitHub page and you look at it, um, they have a nice listing of all the different convolutions that they've um, implemented recently. This is only about half of them. And so this is fascinating because if you look at the dates, these are all different conference papers that have been published. Um, the oldest one on this list is 2016, right? So this is like 50 different models that have all been proposed by the computer science literature since 2016, and the number is only expanding. And so um, Jeff Grossman's paper was really fascinating because it showed a specific example, and you can even see it on this list, it's implemented as number five, um, they showed one convolution, but there's this huge space of other things that we could be thinking about, which is fascinating. Um, this has really taken off in catalysis. If you just look at the number of articles in the past couple of years, um, it was basically unheard of before about 2017, um, and now the number is um, really exploding. Mm -hmm. So we showed this for adsorption energies for CO and hydrogen. Um, this top dashed line was this previous model that we had um, that we published on in Nature Catalysis, where we were basically using these um, coordination numbers. Um, very quickly, this new model was able to beat the previous one that Kevin and I had done by hand. Um, we're down around 0.15 EV now across 12,000 DFT training structures. The number is still going down, so I think if we added more data, things would have continued to improve. Because we reformulated it to look at atomic contributions, we can ask the model um, which atoms in the surface are having the most impact on the final adsorption energy prediction. So if the CO is sitting on top in the upper right, the, car, the copper atom lights up there. If it's sitting in the bridge, both of those copper atoms light up. So we have some understanding of why it's doing um, what it's doing. And I think one thing that's important to keep in mind is um, one of the reasons why this method is working now is not just because these models are complicated and use new machine learning methods or whatever, it's really, I think, being driven by the increase in the size of the data sets that are available. So um, when we published this paper last year, I asked Kevin and Soyan to go through and try and summarize um, what other people had done in this space, and they weren't able to get everything, but they got some. Um, so this is just a table of different um, structure property relationships that people had proposed in catalysis. Um, roughly ordered in terms of when they were published. And what we see is that um, as you go from top to bottom, 
the number of elements in the data set increases, the number of stoichiometries is increasing, the number of space groups is increasing, um, the number of low index facets, corresponding data set sizes are getting much larger. And so really what is happening is um, as the number of training data increases, the models get more complex and you're able to fit more things. And so just as important as this machine learning is, where is the data coming from? Um, is it systematic? Is it indicative of the things that you're interested in? Um, these are all things that we sort of know as physical scientists, but um, it, it's not like you just sit down and play with these models and all of a sudden you come up with a new, um, a new predictive method. It's really about um, what sort of data sets you have and where they're from. And at the time, um, I think the largest that we had was around 40,000. Um, and again, this, uh, this paper that Thomas published um, pushed that up to about 90,000, I think. So this is really moving very quickly at this point. Um, I showed this work to Yusung, um, Zhang, and Keist last fall. And he was excited about this data set. So he um, had some of his students go and start playing around with it. And already people have been building better models than the one that we did. So um, uh, this paper just came out in JPCL with um, Soyan and myself and Yusung. Um, they said, why don't we go from including the hydrogen to instead labeling the adsorption site, saying that the hydrogen is bound to the platinum or the hydrogen is bound to both of these platinum and a bridge site. Same data, different representation. Um, and they found that this new representation actually does um, a lot better than our current one. So CO and hydrogen, um, we were able to get about 0.19 in that paper. Um, so that's the published result that I just showed you. Um, this new method um, at the very bottom is down to about 0.11 or 0.09 for hydrogen, um, which is starting to get um, very, very exciting. And I think is currently state of the art for such a diverse data set across so many different um, space groups. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done here, not just on the machine learning side. It wasn't like they just changed out the different layers of the convolution, but but really thinking about how should you change the representation in order to um, build a better model. And that's something that I, I, I think the chemical engineers and the chemists and the physicists really have to be involved in. Um, you don't get that just by playing around with the machine learning side. We've applied a similar approach to predicting cleavage energies, um, which are important for trying to figure out which low index facets are the most stable. So um, this is an approximation. For a lot of these intermetallics, the surfaces are asymmetric. And so it's not really well established what the surface energy at the top versus the bottom is. Ideally, we would be solving the full problem of what is the lowest energy of the full nanoparticle, including both the facets and the terminations and segregation. But that is super, super hard. Um, as a first step, um, we've been trying to predict the cleavage energy, which is the average of the surface energy at the top and the bottom and that is relatively well established how to do those calculations. So this is an example of a titanium gold crystal. Um, probably the 001 facet is the most stable. Um, there's still uncertainty over which termination, the top or the bottom is, is better, titanium or gold, but we can say probably the 001 direction is the most stable. And we wanna know which of these other low index facets are just so unstable that they're not even worth um, doing. So we built a workflow to take things from the materials project, um, do the surface energy calculations or the cleavage energy calculations. Um, we applied basically the same models, these sort of CGCNN-like ones that have been modified for surfaces, um, and then also with atomic contributions to predict the cleavage energy. And that, um, that process works quite well now. So on the top, we have ground truth from DFT. So nickel gallium was one that I had worked on as a postdoc with Jens and Karen. Um, it correctly gets that 110 is the, um, the most stable facet. Um, the one on the bottom left, CGCNN also perfectly agrees. It can correctly find that 110 is the most stable. It has never seen a nickel gallium before. It's only seen nickel alloys and gallium alloys, but never them together. We can repeat the process for copper aluminum or copper gold. Qualitatively, it's pretty good. It will tell us, um, which are the most interesting facets or which one should we be considering for catalysis? So one thing that I haven't talked about yet is um, how to incorporate uncertainty into these graph convolution methods. 
Um, so this is an area that I think is also very interesting on the computer science side. So um, when we're building these models, it's clear how to improve the accuracy. Um, the, the most standard approach is you build a parity plot where you have the actual label on the x-axis and the predicted one on the y-axis. And the goal is to squeeze as many of the points onto that diagonal as possible. That's the same as reducing the RMSE or the mean absolute error um, of the validation or the test sets during training. So that is super clear. If the model is accurate, they're all on the parity line. If it's inaccurate, they are far from the parity line. That's clear. For um, machine learning methods, a uh, standard approach has been basically um, take the model that you have and then replicate it a bunch of times and train it on different subsets of the data to an ensemble and use the standard deviation of that ensemble in order to predict the uncertainty. This is really easy to, um, uh, to describe. It's really easy to implement. It is not always obvious how well calibrated this final uncertainty is. So in order to calibrate uncertainty, we need additional metrics for um, whether or not the error bars that we're getting are correct or not. So for example, um, the top row um, is accuracy. We already talked about that. Um, for calibration, we can make a calibration curve um, where we basically look at the expected prediction interval on the x-axis and the observed one on the y-axis. And on this plot, we want this um, orange line to be as close to the parity as possible. So a calibrated model will have um, error bars that are indicative of how far the points are from the parity line. And an uncalibrated one will have error bars that are not indicative of how far they are. This works pretty well, but you have to be careful. Um, it is possible to make a well-calibrated model that um, is basically giving the same uncertainty estimate for every point. So that is the bottom row here. So on the bottom right, it is calibrated, but it is not dispersed. The error bars are not actually indicative of how far they are. It's just broadly indicative of what is the uncertainty in the entire model. And so the final thing that we want to try and improve is uh, we want the uncertainty estimates to also be dispersed. So we want this distribution to be wide, which is basically just saying not everything gets the same uncertainty label. This is something you have to watch out for when you're calibrating these. So we took these three metrics and we applied them to as many different methods for predicting uncertainty as we could think of, um, working with um, some collaborators in the machine learning department here at CMU. So these are all different things that we came up with. Um, it's not really clear what is the best or not. Um, these are all, I would say, reasonable choices. So I showed you the ensemble approach. That's clear. Um, the Gaussian process one is the one that we had used with explicit fingerprints um, in the Nature Catalysis paper from 2018. You could replace the dense layers with Bayesian neural networks, which will give you some uncertainty in the final output. Um, you could uh, use a combination of approaches where you use a convolution method to predict the energy and then a separate model to predict the uncertainty or a convolution method to predict the energy and a um, fingerprint method to predict the uncertainty with the Gaussian process. Um, but the one that we found to work um, the best for our model and our data set was what we call a, um, a penultimate fed or a convolution fed Gaussian process. And the idea here is you take the, um, the standard approach, you train your convolutional method as well as possible on the final adsorption energy, and then you rip out the final um, convolution layers, which is basically giving you a, a fixed length description of the entire surface. And then you feed those into a new Gaussian process. So this is sort of related to the idea of, a, um, of deep kernel learning in Gaussian process regression. And this one, um, uh, the paper's out. It's in machine learning science and technology. All of the code is up on GitHub. You can see how we implemented it. It's very similar to the original one. Um, this is the one that we are currently using um, to try and improve the design of experiments process moving forward. Um, one thing I will say is the ensemble approach uh, works quite well. Um, but the uncertainty that you get needs to be calibrated with an additional factor. 
So um, we found that usually there was a constant. For example, it would tell you it was uncertain by a standard deviation of 0.8 EV um, or 0.6 or whatever. Um, there was usually a calibration that was necessary multiplied by like 1.5 or 2 or whatever, depending on the training set, in order to calibrate these. Other people have talked about this for other data sets. So this ensemble approach works, but you can't trust the actual standard deviation unless you do a further calibration for what that constant needs to be. And I'm happy to discuss that in more detail as well. But um, the ensemble approach is nice because it is so easy to implement. It's just um, repeating the process a bunch of times. Okay, so um, I've talked about how we automate the workflows and the databases that we've been constructing and the models that we've been building for different um, intermediates. The last question is, what do you do about the um, design of experiments process? So um, this is a very hard problem because there's lots of different things we're trying to think about at the same time. And um, this design of experiments process is actually hierarchical. Um, so at the lowest level, we're looking at a surface and we're trying to say, what is the lowest energy configuration on that surface? Um, other people have already published on this. This is basically a Bayesian optimization problem for which one to select. At the higher level, um, we have multiple surfaces of the same crystal, and we have to figure out which one do we think is going to be important for describing the activity of a certain composition. And at the highest level, the thing that we often talk with experimental collaborators about where they don't have single crystal control or single facet control is um, which composition is worth testing or worth following up on. And so if you take all these together, um, you want to be figuring out what is the specific calculation at the lowest level that is going to help you answer the question at the highest level. So that's very difficult. Um, so this is work that we're doing now um, in collaboration with Jeff Schneider, who's in the Robotics Institute at CMU, and a postdoc there, Willie Nieswanger. Um, if you're interested, um, we're happy to chat. We're trying to get this implemented and calibrated against the previous methods. Um, but this is really the way that we need to be thinking about the problem. It's not just a single, um, a single one at the lowest level at this point. Uh, if we just do adsorption energies and just try and find as many surfaces that have an interesting um, site as possible, um, these are results from this Nature Catalysis paper in 2018 using a really, really simple machine learning model um, and the original data set. Um, but very quickly, we were able to find a lot of surfaces that were sort of in this region that um, Karen had highlighted as an interesting target for CO2 reduction. Um, we have a lot of DFT confirmed surfaces. We have a lot that also look interesting from machine learning. Um, at this point, um, we can very quickly generate a lot of um, interesting configurations, and we're starting to get to the point where we can say what are the most interesting um, combinations. So um, for example, in the upper right here, these are all combinations that we considered. Every white box is a box that didn't have a stable structure from the materials project that we didn't consider because we couldn't get it to converge. A gray box is, it wasn't the materials project, but precisely zero of the, um, of the surfaces were predicted to be interesting. Everything that has color, there is at least one surface where we've done um, a DFT calculation that we think is the lowest energy on the surface, and it is actually predicted to be in this band for interesting materials. Unsurprisingly, most of the copper alloys look good. A lot of those have color. A lot of the other ones are um, hit or miss. Um, we even have some cases where you take two strong things and mix them together, and it actually leads to a um, weaker binding energy, which is interesting, or vice versa, two weak things becomes a little bit stronger, so that's cool. Um, importantly, uh, one of the papers that I worked on with Karen as a postdoc um, I spent the better part of a year of my life thinking about why nickel gallium was interesting. And we were able to recover that result on its own. It was able to find one or no nickel gallium um, one to one as an interesting material from this really, really simple single descriptor sort of point of view. These are also things that we can, um, because everything is automated now, everything dumps into a database. Um, hopefully you can see this. This is a plot that gets updated every night. Um, I can dig in and see what my um, what students in my group are looking on 
For example, we have a bunch of copper calcium things. I don't know why we're doing copper calcium, but there are some interesting ones. Um, we can see trends from more calcium to the left and more copper on the right. Um, the color is basically saying what the adsorption energies are. These are things that you sort of get for free when everything is automated and sits in databases. And so that's also been really fun um, for us to play around with. Okay, we can cluster these things and say what families are the most interesting. So for example, um, all of these islands, um, we want an island that is sort of in this deep purple region where most of the sites are optimal. Um, if it's black, it means there are stronger binding sites. So that's probably gonna be a material that binds CO2 strongly. If it's really pink, it's probably gonna be all too weakly, like pure gold. Every one of these islands looks fairly interesting that I've marked in purple. And what we found when we were doing the study, um, uh, we had copper aluminum in there um, just because it was easy to add to the original screen. And the overwhelming number of sites that we were finding, the ones that the compositions that were coming up the most often for this ideal descriptor were these copper aluminum alloys. And it seemed like if you look at these islands, no matter how you mix copper and aluminum together, most of those sites looked interesting. It wasn't like there was a single composition or a single surface that was gonna be by far the best and the others were gonna be bad. Um, it seemed like having a little bit of aluminum around helped this um, single descriptor. So this was an observation that we took to an experimental collaborator, um, Ted Sargent at the University of Toronto. And Ted's group um, ran with this and uh, did a bunch of additional experiments um, on copper aluminum and various things. Um, and what they found was that these copper aluminum alloys were actually very interesting. Um, copper aluminum is actually cool because uh, the aluminum you can etch away afterwards and you're left with a porous copper material with really high surface area with a little bit of copper left in the surface. So that still helps those sites. Um, and that improves the overall activity. Um, we got lucky on this one in that it didn't just make an active material. It actually was very selective for CO2 to ethylene. Um, as most of you know, um, the current microkinetic um, studies and descriptors can't really tell us um, what is the right descriptor to really precisely say ethylene versus some other selective product. So um, we got lucky in that it was all ethylene, um, but this did help us focus the experimental time on the copper alloys that were gonna be the most interesting. Obvious extensions of this are, how do we also screen for selectivity at the same time and or what more complicated descriptors will help us um, predict ahead of time which specific C2 or C3 product is getting made. I think that's really the challenge for where the field is going right now. Okay, um, I also just wanna mention that um, these things don't just work for CO2 reduction. Um, that's the example I showed, but Soyan, who's now at um, Sogang University, did a lot of really cool work on um, workflows for oxide chemistry. He did a bunch of iridium oxide polymorphs, um, built a workflow by hand to basically take the bulk structures um, of various polymorphs, find the facets, consider all the coverages, find the unique surface sites, do all the calculations. And um, he was able to apply very similar um, ML methods to predicting uh, the oxygen or OH or OOH energy on these surfaces, given the right data sets. And um, there's actually quite a few different surfaces and polymorphs that are to, predicted to be um, near optimal according to these very simple single descriptors. So um, the star is the really well-known iridium oxide and strontium iridate um, that's been really extremely well studied. Um, but all of these other polymorphs, we can find at least one surface that has a stable coverage um, and is predicted to be active, which we think is really interesting. And um, I know that there's been some follow-up work that came from uh, Michael Bidich and Tom Ligard and Raul on how to exhaustively find all of these polymorphs for and additional ones for radium oxide and others um, that we're really excited about. That was really, really cool work. Okay. Um, so with this in mind, um, there's a lot of really obvious follow-up directions that we're trying to move and trying to improve. So um, really getting at multi-objective optimization where you're trying to trade off all these properties at the same time in this active learning process is hard and is 
um, something that we should be able to do systematically, but we aren't quite there yet. Uh, finding better ways to interact or iterate with high throughput experiments has been really interesting. There's a group here at CMU that can do high throughput experiments for hydrogen evolution. And so um, uh, we had a paper with, uh, with them out looking at those high throughput systems. Um, we're trying to get better at uh, predicting these properties. So working on different machine learning methods, improving the data sets, trying different properties. There's a lot of work to be improved. Um, most of the methods I showed sort of worked across material space, but we're focused on a single uh, chemistry at a time, CO or hydrogen or OH or oxygen or whatever. But ideally we would scale these methods across both the materials and the chemistry simultaneously. And um, finally, uh, it, I really can't stress this enough. All of this work is built on the scientific understanding that comes from really, really detailed kinetic studies on the materials that we do understand. And so um, if we're gonna make progress on finding new descriptors or new ranges or understanding what are the limitations, um, the work that others are doing, other, other groups in the US and Denmark and elsewhere, um, that is really what is gonna have to be improved in order to um, enable the next set of uh, discoveries. And so um, it is not sufficient to just play around with machine learning methods on their own um, which descriptors you're focusing on and why things are improving um, or correlated, uh, that also has to be improved at the same time. I tried to highlight the methods and the data sets as I was going, but uh, I think most of them are also collected on the software data page on the website. So pretty much everything is already open on GitHub. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, we're trying to make it as easy to use as possible. Um, so hopefully this is helpful for, for some of the others of you thinking about similar problems as well. Um, I need to thank a lot of people who have been contributing to this work. So um, Javi and uh, Brandon and Rajesh are three postdocs who have been working in uh, various aspects of this. Soyan, who's now at Sogong, was absolutely phenomenal to work with. And he's doing a lot of really cool work now following up on um, different chemistries and different ways of thinking about problems. So if you're interested in oxygen evolution or other things, Talk to Soyan. Um, uh, PhD students, especially for the stuff I presented, um, Kevin, Mohammed, uh, Perry, June, um, they've all done a lot of awesome work in this area. The others are new first year students, um, various master's students and research assistants who have helped with specific projects, collaborators at the University of Toronto, and then a lot of different funding sources who have been helping to push this forward and allow us to expand. Um, so with that, thanks again, Karen, for inviting me. Um, I'm happy to answer questions um, now and also via email or at least connect you with the right people afterwards. Thanks. Okay, so thank you so much, Zach, for that wonderful talk and also for making everything so readily available for all of us to um, use. So um, I think what we're gonna do is we're gonna use the chat to moderate questions. So if you have a question, oh, and we do, um, Either you can type it into the chat, and I think Zach can see it or we can read it, or put an X and we will, un and, and then you can unmute and speak. Okay, so there yeah. is. Uh, so there's one question now, uh, which is from Sham, and it says, uh, my question is whether local coordination fingerprint method for getting adsorption energies easily transferable to complex molecules like benzene or furfural. Yeah, that is an excellent question. Um, I would say the only work that I'm really aware of in this area, um, but I might be missing something, is um, work by, for example, Dion Blockos, who has looked at benzene and other small molecules on single metal surfaces like platinum, um, benzene or furfural, or whatever. Um, the approaches that he used and found were fairly reasonable were um, basically um, uh, group additivity methods that were being applied, seemed to work fairly well. I don't think we can really answer this question with these graph methods until we have larger data sets of larger molecules, right? And so I think that's an obvious question to be thinking about, but 
it's really hard to generate that data. And um, I think that's been limiting how we think about things. So my gut feeling is we are going to be able to learn these because we are showing it the full graph with how things are connected, but that hasn't been done yet. Okay, great. Uh, so the next question is from Joe Gauthier, and he asks, uh, can you please comment on the accuracy of the underlying data sets uh, being used? Uh, for instance, GGA struggles to describe uh, correlated materials such as 3D transition metals, uh, which would complicate the reference being used to train the uh, neural networks. Uh, is there time if, okay, if there's time for another question, has your group had any luck training forces with these models? Yeah, um, both are excellent questions. Um, I, uh, of course, the model is only going to be as good as the data set. Um, so if there are systematic problems in the underlying calculations, those are going to be just as reproduced in the final outputs. Um, the methods we're using, um, uh, we basically just applied RPBE everywhere with sort of standard methods because it seemed to work fairly well for um, uh, adsorption energies. Um, obviously, it doesn't work very well for bulk properties or surface properties like surface energies. Um, in applying to new materials, this is something we have to be really careful of. And so, um, for example, one obvious extension is how to really do this for a bunch of oxides. And there's so many things caught up in that question of what are the right set of settings? What should the plus u value be? How do you trust things? Um, that you have to be very careful. Um, one approach that I think has not been explored is how to take a large data set of low quality calculations like this and upgrade them to higher quality. So for example, if you do a smaller number of really detailed calculations, could you systematically learn the difference between RPBE and beef or beef and some hybrid functional or whatever? Um, again, you have to have the right data in order to do that. But um, I think that's one direction that we should be thinking about. Um, and then as for the forces, um, the closest thing I've seen has been models like um, Schnett, where they claim that they can do forces on small molecules, and they claim that they can do energies on inorganic materials. But as far as I know, um, no one has published a paper that shows that you can do forces across inorganic materials. Mm -hmm. I think it is an obvious question, and I think um, I think things are going to um, end up working out. But you have to be very careful about um, whether or not the graph approach has enough information. The, the way things are represented in CGC and N by default, um, I don't think there's enough information to really get the forces. But really changing things so that you can do it um, is something we're working on now. Great. Uh, I, I was also wondering, so you, you're looking at intermetallics. Have, have you also thought about uh, high entropy alloys? Is that something too complicated to do? Because they're also, I think, uh, people are starting to look at them for CO2 reduction. Now, so. Yeah, I really love those, um, those papers by Jan and others in the new center they have on high entropy alloy catalysis. Yeah. Um, uh, we've been looking at HEAs for oxidation resistance. Mm -hmm. We've been playing around with taking the intermetallic data and trying to predict HEA adsorption energies. So far, it seems like those things are not consistent. You also need to do some additional alloy calculations. Mm -hmm. um, it's not like you get it for free, but I think it's a super interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, the hardest part in my mind for really expanding this to HEAs is figuring out what are the stable phases. Yeah. If you look at the HEA phase diagrams, it's not like they're all BCC or FCC. For every combination, it could be one or a mixture. Yeah. And if you guess the wrong one, the system is unstable and everything is hard to do from a calculation point of view. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think it's fascinating. I, I want to do more, but um, you just have to be careful about the structures you're using. Great. OK. Uh, the next question is from Michael Craig. And he asks, uh, so about the uncertainty measurements, is the Bayesian neural network based on the uh, CG, CNN? Uh, or is it trained as a separate model? Yeah. Um, we basically trained it um, start to finish with Bayesian um, dense layers um, on, those, um, on those final ones from the convolution, convolution to the energy. So it is 
Um, it was very easy to implement because there's a package called Pyro, which allows you to drop those things in. So that's awesome. Um, I feel like there might have been some, um, but we had, uh, June worked on this for, I think, uh, three or four months trying to get it to really be calibrated, but weren't successful. Um, it, it worked okay, but not, not very well. Um, I think there's probably additional things that could be done to make this process better. Um, so I, I encourage other people to revisit this and try a different approach or different um, priors or whatever. Um, but yes, it was basically CGCNN architecture um, with these Bayesian dense layers. Uh, so the next question is by Yan Wei, uh, and the question is, are there efforts in developing invertible representations for inverse design of catalysts? Um, yeah, also a phenomenal question. Um, this is, um, I, I feel like you can sort of roadmap out where catalysis is going to go based on what happened with small molecules and, um, yeah, basically small molecules. So I would say we are where small molecules were five years ago maybe a little bit longer. And the next approach for them was um, how to make things invertible. And um, with small molecules, it's relatively easy because there's a grammar and a language that you can use to check if it's a real molecule or not. And part of the, part of the um, improvements in that area have been coming up with really good grammars so that if you can generate a string, it is guaranteed to be an answer. And people like Alanis Borogruzic have really pushed this forward with um, selfies or whatever the most recent method is called. Um, there's only been a couple of examples for invertible representations in inorganic materials. And those are just on the bulk side, I think. Um, so Yu Sung Jung has had a couple of papers. Um, uh, I think Björk Kemmer also had one to like try and figure out where to add things um, on a um, some sort of oxide surface. So I, I think it's an excellent question, but it's going to be really, really difficult to figure out, like, is that thing feasible or not? Um, so I, I think the field is moving there. I would look at you some papers. I think he's doing the best job right now for these inorganic materials. Great. Uh, the next question is by Victor Fung, and he asks, uh, can you talk, comment on coverage effects? Uh, are they considered in this framework? Yeah, um, we don't consider coverage effects right now. We assume that they're being handled in the microkinetic model that is giving us targets. Um, the way that we were doing adsorbate placement, it was a little bit difficult to add, um, add higher coverages. Um, Jeff Greeley just had a paper out this month that showed a nice graph method, sort of like, um, I, I would say, sort of similar in, in approach to what um, Thomas did with CatKit that I think will make this process easier. And so I think we're moving in that direction, but obviously it is, um, it's just hard to figure out what's reasonable or not. Like R2, it's a race too close or not, or what is feasible. Great. Uh, the next question by Stefan Ringer, and he asks, um, he has a question similar to Joe's. Uh, you said that the accuracy for the best model is around 0.15 EV. That is typically in the range of GGA errors. However, in DFT, we often see error cancellation, which, uh, which saves us uh, in predicting trends. Uh, he's, he's, uh, I'm a bit worried that such trend prediction could be lost when you apply machine learning methods. So errors are not consistently higher among various materials. Can you comment on, on that? Yeah, uh, these are all excellent questions. Um, this is something we've thought a little bit about. Um, I, uh, you can change the way that you fit these models so that they reproduce differences. Nothing is stopping you from hacking the loss function at this point so that you are fitting um, differences instead of absolute energies. Um, if you want to do things that way, that's something that could be explored. And I think it's a cool idea. Um, we've also thought about like, how could we get beef like uncertainty where then afterwards you can subtract things off. Um, it's just not super clear how to make that like a rigorous training, a rigorous training question. Like this is really where you need to understand um, the actual training process of the ML model and not just go for a target. Uh, the nice thing is that now that everything is in PyTorch, 
it is relatively easy to try these things yourself and implement a new method for um, a new loss function or a new way of training things. So um, the pace at which we can try new models is increasing. And I think that makes what you're talking about maybe feasible now where it would have been a, a PhD level, like five year effort um, not too long ago. Okay. Uh, the, que the next question is by Amin. Uh, and the question is, uh, are there useful information that you can get from other modeling techniques such as classical molecular dynamics to train the machine learning models that you have? Uh, yeah, I think we can be learning from some of those. Um, so the obvious one is you should start with an assumption of there being some Leonard Jones interactions. That is a reasonable assumption. We know they're there. Um, that incorporates the fact that two atoms can overlap. Um, how to systematically include that, whether or not you add it as part of the model or you change the model structure so that it's more like a classical force field. Rampy Rampersad had some cool papers where basically um, the activation functions themselves were Leonard Jones. So you were effectively fitting inputs into those to sort of learn classical lessons and, and include those. Um, you could just subtract it off. Um, other people like, um, I think Gabor Jani has played around with using type binding DFT as a, as a base to subtract off. I haven't seen that work for surface science, but these are all things that we should be, we should be considering, especially when we are in a, um, a super small data regime. And, um, what I've been asking Muhammad to do specifically is, um, try and make it as easy as possible to test that question. So um, make ASC pseudo calculators that are basically using another thing as a reference to subtract off so that you can use whatever ASC calculator you want as a base um, before training your machine learning predictions. Um, and hopefully that will also make these things a little bit more, um, a little bit more systematic or a little bit easier to test. But, this is also a little heuristic, so there's an unlimited number of possibilities that we can use there. I haven't seen like one thing just work all the time. I, I, I will say the stuff that Muhammad has done with Leonard Jones or Morse potentials, like super, 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 super simple, um, has worked surprisingly well at fixing some of these problems. So I, I don't think you have to do something super complicated here. Okay. Uh, one thing I was curious about uh, for some of these adsorbates is that um, there could be significant uh, stabilization because of the solvent. And I'm wondering if you are also thinking about how one can predict uh, things like solvation energies for these different adsorbates. Yeah, um, I would say I'm not an expert in solvation energy calculations, but um, we are working with um, uh, Joel Varley at Livermore to implement um, implicit or um, sort of hybrid salvation methods uh, to predict corrections. Um, I think it really comes back to the training set. Um, it is really hard to generate the sort of data that you're talking about. Um, it's really easy to turn on implicit salvation and VASP, but it's hard to know how much to trust that. And Kevin and Joe and others have shown that you have to be very careful with those methods. Um, the stuff that we've been doing with Joel, um, is working pretty well, but those are very detailed calculations that you have to babysit. Yeah. And so it is a little hard to imagine doing that like for everything at the same time. Yeah. Um, from my perspective, this is really like a fundamental science problem that needs to be solved first. Like someone needs to come up with a scheme that is um, reasonably fast or not too inexpensive, mm -hmm. not, not too expensive. And more importantly, um, you can just apply and not have to worry about systematic errors or convergence problems. And if someone has that, like, I'm happy to scale that out and try it on a lot of stuff, but I don't think that is, that is really there. And it, it's, it's not worth doing until you trust the energies you're generating anyways. Yeah. Okay. The, the next question is by Kevin Rossi. Uh, so to what, what extent are these multi-fidelity schemes mentioned, uh, they can be used to account for coverage or salvation effects. And okay, I think that's sort of yeah. uh, what we just spoke about now. Um, I, yeah, I will say like 
multi-fidelity machine learning is a thing. And there's a lot of ways of implementing that. Like you can fit a bunch of differences or you could fit multiple properties at the same time. Um, I, I, I don't think there's one approach. I haven't seen any approach that like really seemed like a super obvious way forward. So I think there's more things to be done there. But um, the, I think this question also gets at what Joe was asking about with different calculation levels. Um, it's super interesting, but it's hard to do until you have the right data sets to test which of these methods work well. Um, maybe I can just ask one quick question. So do you see any challenges in extending your, your cleavage energy study to consider, say, segregation energies or towards like predicting stable core shell type particles as catalysts? Yeah, I, um, I don't think there's any fundamental limitations. Yeah. Um, the representations have been so, um, so robust to different properties that I feel like you should be able to get at those questions. Um, it really just comes back to what are you going to use to generate the configurations to train this thing? So um, one thing I've been playing around with as a toy problem is, um, like you're saying, just like trying random swaps on the lattice or trying segregations and seeing like just um, how easy it is to generate a structure that looks reasonable. And that's sort of the first step to making a high throughput system to generate the data you need. And then once you have a workflow, any workflow, whatever, that um, generates interesting configurations that are gonna tell you something, then you can scale it up. But the actual representation itself, I don't think there's anything in here that's gonna limit you from predicting a segregation energy at the same time. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, so I think any questions here? No? All right. So I think you've answered all the questions. So thank you so much for this extended discussion as well. So we're really hoping we'll see you in person sometime, not, uh, not in the two. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. Thank yeah. you so much. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, Antish, right. for organizing. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, thank you. Okay. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.